Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I hope that you all had a good uh, visit to Expo. Uh, hopefully, here's an internship for the future. Uh, and because of that, I know there were many of you that were here uh, on Tuesday. So we'll, we'll try to go over that uh, quickly uh, today. Now, before we do that, I know that the homework is due tomorrow. And some of you guys are struggling with computing vertical stress for the LAS file and the deviation Perfect. Good. Okay. So let me pull out some of my notes. I'll refer to that section. This is the problem that you have, okay? I'm, give, I'm giving you that form of two files. An LAS file and a dot .dev file. This is a, a well-logging file. This is a deviation survey. This well-logging file tells you properties of the formation as a function of measured depth. But that's not necessarily true depth. In order to calculate vertical stress, you need true depth. Okay? You may have a wellbore that goes vertical and then goes into a lateral for a very, very long distance. It doesn't matter how long it is. You're not adding weight to that as long as it goes horizontal. So you need to do that conversion. Uh, let, let me tell you um, part of the solution here, uh, if you check that deviation file that links measure depth in here and true vertical depth in here, you will see that the actual surface of the water, so you will have numbers here, and uh, the actual surface of the water is at about 25 meters of measure depth. Just here, you start at zero. And that kind of makes sense, right? So what this file is telling you is that here, the rotary table is at 25 meters above the surface of the water. So up to, to 25 meters, there is nothing here. There is no reading. There is nothing. In, in many of these LAS files, uh, zero may be a measured quantity. And it may be a meaningful quantity. So when there is no reading in many of these files, you will find something like 999.5, something like that. It doesn't make sense to have a, a value of density which is negative, right? So, so in, in that case, uh, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, at that region, you may assume a value. If you don't have any data, or, or if you don't need it, just, just ignore it. So actually, something like this you need to mean no read. Then what you have to do, everything you have to do is just to this data, to each measured depth, you need to calculate a true depth, OK? But this file is not going to have the same numbers as that one. It doesn't match. You see what I mean when it doesn't match? For example, here you're going to have, like, say, 4,000 data points. And probably here you have 1,000. And they, they do not necessarily match each other. So in order to do that, to get a true vertical depth in this table, what you have to do is you have to do an interpolation. And that's where this command in MATLAB, and it's very likely in Python, it's going to be very, uh, very similar. Uh, anyone already did the convert in Python? No? OK. Well, this one is a MATLAB command. But very likely, it's going to be the same in Python. 
with this command, what you do is you do linear interpolation. So you you get you give to this uh, function x, which was, is going to be measure depth known from the deviation file. You give it y, which is going to be true vertical depth known from the deviation file, and you give it x, which is the value where you want the new true vertical depth to be computed, which is going to be this value over here for measure depth, right? And at an arbitrary depth, this function is going to give you linear interpolation of this one, and it's going to give you the value that you're looking for. The unknown at the, at the given, at the arbitrary uh, measure depth. And after you do that, you just need to do the same calculations that you did for, for problem number three. So, raise your hand if you already finished problem number three. Please. One person. Uh, no one else? I know that you were busy, guys, with Expo, but I, I recommend that you start working on the homework because it's not, it's not super easy, okay? And before you do problem number four, do problem number three, because it's exactly the same, problem number four as number three, but it just has, uh, problem number four, it has more, more numbers. So, so the yes. function, it, it is linear. Yeah, it's a linear interpolation. Okay. So, it, what, it's, what it's going to do is, between these two points, it's going to find the two points in which for which you have a, a, an unknown, and it's going to go in between these two points, and it's going to give you that point, which is a linear interpolation between the two closest points. Yes? So are you just finding the true vertical depth that goes with the measure depth in yes. the LIS file? Yes. Why, why do you want to do that? Because in this file, you don't have densities. Oh, OK. In this file, you do have densities. And so from here, uh, once you know the density, and once you know your, let me make a space here. I want to erase this line. So the actual LAS file doesn't have that column, right? But what you want to do is to get here a new column, TVDSS. And it is from this column where you're going to compute your delta Z. So then you can calculate SD from the LMS file? Correct. Okay. So you have depth, you have density, uh, which for many of these is going to be, say, 2.213, uh, something like that. You have depth, you have density, and uh, you, you know what is G, and that's everything you need, right? So we, we saw that the vertical stress is going to be uh, just a result of adding the weight of layers above uh, the one that you are calculating. Uh, so uh, for example, let, let's do one example uh, of all of us together. Let's say that the true vertical depth here is 3,000. And immediately above that, the, the true vertical depth is 2,999, and here the density of that depth is 2.200. The calculated SV is going to be what? Can someone tell me what is that's going to be? The two bulk density is added. Okay. So 2.2 .2 plus 2.213. This one, in order to apply the numerical integration, you just do an average of that, divided by 2 times g, times g right? 9.8. Uh, I'm not using units here, OK? But uh, you, you should use the right units later on. I'm just going to put G times the delta C 
3,000 minus 2,899. That's going to be just the weight of the layer immediately above the one that you are calculating. To that, you have to add the cell above that one. So for example, at the top, at zero, uh, this is going to be zero, and then it's going to start increasing. You're just adding up the weight of each leg. So guys, remember that today, uh, tomorrow is the deadline for the homework, okay? If you have any questions, just, just let me know, send me an email. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be glad to help out. Also, you can send an email to the, to the TA. Yes? I'm going to try to be, but I'm not feeling very well today. Okay. So I might go a little bit earlier, but but I'm going to be available in the meantime. Okay. You might, so you might like go at 4 and then like leave earlier, or you might go before 4? I think I might go uh, around 4, because I have another class from uh, 2 to 3, 7. Okay. I don't know. I feel better. I'm going to be here. OK? All right. Uh, but it's not too difficult, guys. You just do this, and then, and then you, you, you will see that it makes sense. But first, do problem number three, and then try to do problem number three. All right? Uh, okay. So try to do homework, okay? If, if, you, if you can make it, just, just do your best, and, uh, and we will uh, talk about the solution uh, next week. All right. So let me put this in here. For you guys that were in Expo, I'm waiting here on, uh, on Tuesday. Uh, let, me, let me tell you that we talked about a very, very important topic, uh, which is uh, horizontal stress. So we're going to go very quickly through this uh, for you to catch up. But uh, the main idea here is that at depth, we already know how to calculate for pressure. With hydrostatic pore pressure, or if, even if we have uh, over pressure, we know how to do that. We know how to calculate vertical stress. Actually, that one is very easy. It's just the overburden at a given depth. But we don't know what is horizontal stress. That's an unknown. We, we don't know that a priori. I know there are some equations out there, and, and we are going to go to those equations later on. That allow you to to estimate what is horizontal stress, but truly we do not know that one. And that's a big unknown, and it's super important for geomechanics, and especially super important for hydraulic fracture. I, I did an example here saying, you know, if you were to inflate a balloon here in, in the classroom or at the given depth underwater, it would be mostly spheric balloon. And that, that's why the pressure in all directions, in water or in air, is the same. But with a hydraulic fracture or with the same balloon here, that's not going to be the case. It's, it's not going to be spherical. It's going to be flat. And it's going to be flat because it, this type of um, cavities or openings uh, are going to be always perpendicular to the minimum principal stress. So uh, I worked out through some examples over here, and uh, I even worked about an application problem. And uh, I'd like to go to that application problem now. Okay? So we're going to revisit the application problem to make, to make this case. And probably I'm going to have a chance to redeem myself and draw well the state of Texas. Right? So state of Texas, somebody from West Texas. No one? Uh, so something like that. So so you know, Big Ben should be somewhere around here. Amarillo, somewhere around there. Midland, Lubbock, and Galveston around there, Houston. Something like that. I'm not very good at people. I have to improve that. Okay, so um, Somewhere around here is the Barnett shape. It happens that in the Barnett shape, 
the horizontal stresses are not the same in in uh, perpendicular directions. So we have something which is called the maximum horizontal stress and the minimum horizontal stress. I'm looking from the top, okay? And this one is SH max, which is more or less, if this is the north, is, if I remember correctly, is at uh, 60 degrees uh, from the north. That's something that the geologists call azimuth. So they will say the azimuth of SH max is 60 degrees, which is equivalent to say the direction of SH max is 60 degrees uh, from the north. All right? So if this is SH max, that means at 90 degrees, uh, and that's a property we're going to see a little bit later, but perpendicular to one, we're going to have the minimum principal stress. And into the paper, Zoom down. Into the paper, we want to have the vertical stress. Okay? Uh, all right. So let, let's now draw a block of that <coughs> part of Texas. This is called a, a block diagram, where you have completed the well work and you're about to do hydraulic fracturing. A depth, and let's say somewhere over here, uh, you have the Barnesia. And I'm going to further assume that the minimum principal stress is coming perpendicular to the right face of this block. Uh, let's assume for the moment I have a vertical well. Uh, what is going to be the shape of those hydraulic fractures? Let's further say that I want to do many hydraulic fractures, so I'm going to put clusters here of perforations at several depths. Can, can someone tell me, someone that would, uh, wasn't here on Tuesday, uh, what is going to be the shape of those hydraulic fractures? always perpendicular to SH, okay? And that's something that you should remember. Uh, hydraulic fractures, open mold fractures, are going to be, uh, I'm going to open always perpendicular to SH mean. So SH, SH mean is coming that direction, which is that same SH mean over there. Hydraulic fractures are going to be like this. And if you have multiple hydraulic fractures, probably they will start short over here, small, and they will join to a simple hydraulic fracture. <coughs> so it will be something like this, and then they might grow coming out of the paper into a single hydraulic fracture. Uh, do you think you are optimizing, in this case, the use of, a, of the well board to make uh, multiple hydraulic fractures? Not very likely, right? Uh, so, Let's say, okay, you know, I'm not optimizing uh, my well board. I'm going to drill a lateral. So I have more hydraulic fractures. And, and so I'm going to drill, I'm going to draw the same block. Same well board. Complete your well board. Start pumping fracturing fluid and water. And now I'm going to drill the lateral. And so this is three dimensions, okay? I get to the, to the base on, I start drilling the lateral. And again, this is SH mean. And now I have clusters of perforations at this location. What is going to be the direction of those hydraulic fractures? So vertical well board, lateral. Yes? It'll still be perfectly for the test that you never go up and down instead of left and right. 
they will go up, what do you mean up and down like here? As in up against SV, I suppose. It's going to go parallel to the tube. It's going to be like perpendicular if that's been the parallel to the tube. Parallel to the tube. Uh, so it's a little bit difficult to do now with this piece of paper, right? Uh, but uh, probably it, it's going to be very, I just draw it. Uh, so you were saying that it's going to go up and down. So if they start small, somewhere over here, perpendicular to SH mean, they're going to be something like this. Right? Perpendicular to SH mean. And then probably uh, as they grow, they're going to contact each other. But then it's going to be all just one single fracture. Uh, perpendicular to this direction. Uh, and I'm assuming one more thing, and you were saying that they want to grow up and down. In some of these formations, you have what is called vertical barriers for hydraulic fracture propagation. And we're going to talk about that later. So I'm assuming that it's just contained in the formations. It's not going. It goes up and down, but it just stops uh, somewhere. Uh, where the formation finishes. Um, okay, so now, do you think this is good? Do you think we have taken advantage of the, the wellbore, the vertical wellbore, trying to maximize the surface area of the hydraulic fracture in contact with the formation? No, what, what did we do wrong? We drilled the wrong direction. We drilled the wrong direction, right? So you would have been much better off if from here we get a wellbore that goes <coughs> into the direction of SH If I have multiple perforation clusters, when those hydraulic fractures start to grow up, always they are going to grow perpendicular to. I forgot to tell you something here, something very important. I'm assuming that. SH mean is S3, the least principal stress. And that actually happens in the Barnet formation when SV is larger than SH max and larger than SH mean. So in this case, this is the minimum principal stress. It's not always the case that the horizontal stress is the minimum principal stress, okay? It happens in most of Texas, but there are several other parts of the world where this, this is not the case. So uh, be careful about that. All right. So now that we know that this is the minimum principal stress, if we do multiple perforations and we drill the lateral in the correct direction, as Mr. Sue, is that correct? Mr. Sue has suggested our hydraulic fractures are going to be, let me help my drawing with drawing, just, they're going to be like this. And now look at how much more area we're covering with this hydraulic fractures. Uh, compared to that one. You see here probably with those two of those we already have the area that we covered before. And now we have much, many more uh, much more surface area in contact with the reservoir than we had before. And actually, you know, if you if you can't see very well what is the, that in my drawing, it will be that. Okay? It will be the lateral with the minimum principal stress which in this case horizontal and multiple fractures uh, spaced uh, every so on. This is a very uh, uh, simple idealization. We're going to see later on that it turns out to be a little bit more complex than that. Yes, you have a question. Um, considering the drawing, it looks like the vertical stress is going to be less than the horizontal axis. I'm not sure. Why that? Because like, the cracks will always open uh, Perpendicular to the lower stress, so like it's going like opposite. It's going perpendicular to SH mean. That's for sure. 
And then if you look I see. The I see. I, I, I see your point. Um, we could have here in the in this case in the Barnett shale, this happens to be the case. The vertical stress is higher than the horizontal stress. But we could have the same type of uh, fracturing pattern if we had those two switch. Uh, SH max is higher than SV. The hydraulic fracture is going to always propagate perpendicular to the minimum principle of stress. And uh, what I'm suggesting here with those these ovals that tend to grow more in this direction than the vertical direction is because sometimes you have vertical variations of stiffness of the rock, and that creates variation of the stress in the horizontal direction. That's something that we're going to see in a bit, okay, when we get into the, into the theory of linear elasticity to explain that. But, uh, but, but in this case, it is like that. Vertical stress is higher than the horizontal stress, and that's higher than the minimum principal stress. And the fractures are going to care just about the minimum principal stress. They're going to open in planes. Uh, perpendicular to the minimum principal stress, and ideally they would grow as discs, and that's something called penny shaped fractures. But if you find some barriers of propagation, they will start to deform and go into some other shape that may be more like a novel rather than, than a, uh, a penny shaped uh, fracture. Uh, okay, so uh, horizontal stresses. Again, let me emphasize, we, don't, we do not know the value of those. And it, it turns out that in many places, the uh, horizontal stress may not be the minimum principal stress. And sometimes, even the, a horizontal stress may be the maximum principal stress. There are three types of these, OK? And I recommend you read my notes. I'm not going to go over these again. Uh, it's very clear in the note, but we have three cases. Normal faulting, uh, which is uh, the one uh, found uh, most often, don't worry, and in which the maximum principal stress is vertical stress, and you have two other horizontal stresses, Texas, from your Belize, or from Mexico, many of those places. But respect that. Strike sleep, where the maximum principal stress is horizontal, and the minimum is horizontal, and vertical is intermediate, and reverse faulting, uh, in which the minimum principal stress is vertical. If the minimum principal stress is vertical, what do you think is going to be the shape of hydraulic fractures? They're going to be flat. They're going to be horizontal. So yep, it's going to be like this. If, if vertical stress is the minimum principal stress, then you, you could do multiple uh, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing and it will be all just parallel. And in these cases, you're literally lifting the ground as you do, as you do hydraulic fracture because you're just making a void space. But sometimes you can do proper uh, in between layers. OK. Uh, so let's finish up with this uh, topic of horizontal stresses by making some, some plots. And, and these plots are going to tell us in graphically the variations between stress uh, regimes. So we already know that how to calculate pore pressure. How to, how to calculate uh, depth. Uh, let's say the pore pressure is somewhere over here. It doesn't have to be a straight line. You know that by now. And vertical stress is somewhere over here. In a normal faulting stretch regime, the two horizontal stresses are going to be located between those two lines. So here, you will have SH mean. And here, you will have SH max. 
As we're going to see later, I'm, I'm making here a simplification, and I'm assuming those are just lines, and straight, more or less straight lines, but they don't have to be straight lines. Actually, uh, they, they, they can vary quite a bit, and we're going to see that later on. So this is going to be a normal fold. If you go into a region like many parts of Australia, of uh, Argentina, close to the mountains, where you have more tectonic strains, the plates are pushing against each other, uh, you, let's say that we have hydrostatic pore pressure, we have here SD, SH mean is going to be there, and SH max is going to be above SB, above the value of SB. And for the last case, for reverse faulting, where you have tectonic strains in two directions, so that means that you're pushing in two directions uh, perpendicular to each other, so the horizontal stress are higher than the vertical stress. Then we're going to have here uh, pore pressure. We're going to have vertical stress. And higher than that, you're going to find SH mean. And even higher than that, you want to have SH max. Right after this, we're going to see the theory of linear elasticity. The theory of linear elasticity is going to allow us to calculate these values, SH mean, SH max, as a function of strain. You may imagine that as you push from the sides, you're going to build up stress. That's a property of all uh, elastic materials. And, and you're going to see that the more stress we have in one direction, the higher that stress is going to be. Uh, it also makes sense that, and we're going to see that with equations, the horizontal stresses, if you don't have any tectonic strains, should be less than the vertical stress. Uh, we're going to see that in the equation, but you know, it kind of makes sense. Uh, if you just had water, the water pushes to the side with the same uh, pressure that it pushes in the vertical direction because pressure is the same in all directions. But if you have a solid, it's not the same because some of the vertical stress is taken by the internal strength of the rock. So it's going to push to the sides, but not as much as if you have a fluid. And that's 